Hello, I want to show you an Amiga magic trick. In my last video, I showed you how I got my Amiga 2000 on the internet by using a plip box. Well, take a look at this. This is my Amiga 500 Plus, connected to one of the A590s you've seen on my channel before. Now you can see on the monitor that I'm sending ping messages out to Google servers quite happily. Now watch as I unplug the plip box. It's still working! It clearly isn't getting its internet through the plip box. So how's it getting internet access? Well, in this video, I'll show you how this magic trick works. First, let's explore inside the machine. I want you to see that it's a real machine and not just a pie or a mister hiding inside. So I'll remove the case. And I'll move the keyboard out of the way. Just pointing out a few bits here. This is the RGB to HDMI adapter that's giving me the HDMI output for the monitor. Nothing more. This is the PCB for the Go drive, the Go textile drive I have installed in this machine. This here is the original 1 meg RAM expansion my parents bought me when I was 12 for my birthday. Aside from these items, this is all pretty standard. So have you figured it out yet? Well, there's one part we haven't looked inside yet, and that's the A590. If you remember from my previous videos, all of my A590s have blue SCSI V2s inside of them. But there's something a little strange here. I'll remove the lid so you can see inside. See the activity LED here? It's going wild! Yes, the blue SCSI is the source of the internet. Oh, and yes, I did try and trick you. I disconnected the hard drive activity LED that was on the case. Back in August last year, the Blue Scuzzy V2 got special support for emulating the Dynaport Ethernet card that was available on some Apple Macintosh machines. Weirdly, well, at least for me, I thought, it's actually a Scuzzy device. And by using a Pi Pico W with the Blue Scuzzy instead of the standard Pi Pico, and by creating a special blank file with a special file name and saving it onto the SD card, the Blue Scuzzy boots up with an extra device, the Dynaport device. Now that's all well and good, but there's no driver for this for the Amiga. Well, there wasn't until now. Now on the Amiga, I've never written anything outside of Amos, especially not a driver, but most of that stuff's written in C and that's something I do understand. But to help me get started, I wanted an easy way to build this from my PC. I started looking at VS Code Amiga Debug that installs into Visual Studio Code and allows you to cross compile. What's really nice is it allows you to debug what you create directly there inside of the emulator. There's also a fork of this project which takes the previous package and bundles support for Amiga libs such as CLib2 and Magic User Interface. So I decided to start with writing something simple just to get me started. I wrote some code partially copied from snippets on the internet to open the SCSI device and query what's on each ID. Eventually, I ended up with some code that could tell me the SCSI ID the Dynaport device was configured on. And here you can see my code running on my Amiga 500 Plus. If you look closely at what I'm doing here, there's something quite funny. At this point, my driver didn't exist, so to help me develop this as quickly as possible, I'd use the plip box so I could quickly transfer new versions to my Amiga. What a twist! Anyway, by studying the source for the blue SCSI, I was able to find out how the Dynaport device worked and kind of reverse engineered how it was communicating. One by one, I implemented each of the commands, from reading and writing Ethernet frames to obtaining the MAC address of the device and the commands needed to search and configure the Wi-Fi. Now, I had all the commands I needed, but on their own, they're not that much use. Network drivers on the Amiga have to be what's called SANA2 drivers, and they're very well documented. They're not the simplest things to write, and I've never written anything like this before, and I didn't really want to start from scratch. Luckily for me, I don't have to. There's several drivers with source code around on the internet. For example, the source code for the PRISM PCMCIA card is available on Aminet. Then there's the Blipbox source code on GitHub. I also found the source code for the ZZ9000 Zorro card, which also includes a network driver, and I decided to start with this one. Suspiciously, all of these drivers shared a lot of common patterns and code, and after spending some time reading it, I realised there were actually only two files I needed to edit. The device C and the device H files. Now I'm not going to go through all of those changes. That wouldn't make a very interesting video. And there's quite a lot about the inner workings of the Amiga operating system you have to understand, and that I had to learn. The biggest issue is how do you debug something like this? Well, I've heard of this technique before, but I've never used it. You debug this by using the so-called kernel debugging features. The idea here is that you connect the serial port of the Amiga to another computer. 
In my case, my PC using a null modem cable and a USB to serial adapter. Inside the driver, you can use some special commands to send messages that will appear on the PC. This was very handy and allowed me, one issue at a time, to slowly get things working. However, there's a big difference between things starting to work and actually having a stable internet connection. The first time I tried the driver, the Amiga crashed. But by using this, I was able to track down exactly which line in the program caused which issues each time. Anyway, I got to the stage where I could actually see the Amiga sending out and receiving packets from the network, but nothing was working. So clearly, something else was wrong. I started by looking at Wireshark on the PC to monitor the network. I knew the first thing the Amiga would try to do is issue a DHCP request to try and get an IP address. And I wasn't even sure if that message was being sent. But I was pleased to discover it was. And being sent correctly too. And the internet router here was even replying. However, for some reason, the Amiga wasn't receiving it. Now there are so many different reasons why the Amiga wouldn't see this. And I wasn't sure if it was the code I'd written. But after checking it over several times, I couldn't find a fault. So I wrote some code to dump out the contents of all received Ethernet packets to the kernel debug serial port. And at first look, it all looked absolutely fine. Until I started to look a little closer. Now I've paused this here. This phrase just could not be in the data received over the network. Somehow, some of these bytes were wrong. So I decided I'd pre-fill the memory where the packet was going to load into with a known sequence. In this case, I wrote the alphabet to it, and then tried again. Now look carefully this time. You can see lots of bits of the alphabet here, and they should not be there. These areas should actually contain real data, but for some reason haven't been written over. I enabled the blue SCSI debug options and checked what it was sending, and it was sending the correct information, meaning this must be a strange issue with the SCSI device driver on the Amiga. Now there's no way I can fix that device, but I was wondering if maybe I could find a pattern and then update the blue SCSI software to work around it. Leaving this debug information scrolling away, I sent several messages out on the network from my PC, and after a lot of trial and error, I discovered that data received needed to be a multiple of 24 bytes for it to be received correctly. Upon fixing that, the Amiga succeeded with its DHCP request, and it got an IP address. Now this change hasn't been merged into the official build at the time of me recording this, so it may well change. I decided to send an extra tag in the request to signal to the blue SCSI that this was an Amiga asking. And if that flag was detected, then use a different method for sending the packet back by rounding up the data transfer to the nearest 24th byte, which I then compiled and installed on my blue SCSI. Then it was just a tiny matter of changing the code in my driver to send this signal, which I then compiled, copied to my Amiga, and started it. Now that the driver was working correctly, I did some further work on it to tidy it up and clean it up and improve it a little bit more. So, with that working, let's do some speed tests, and for fun, we'll compare it with the Plitbox. We'll start with a ping. Firstly, this is Plitbox pinging Google. Fairly stable, around 33 milliseconds. And here's my device. Not quite as good, it's a little bit more unstable, around 80 milliseconds. Next up, I'm going to pull a copy of Roadshow from my PC via FTP, starting with Plitbox. Hmm, around 20 to 25k a second? That's not bad. And this time with my device. Seems to be settling around 33k a second, a little faster. I'll take that. OK, well, I did slightly cheat there. The driver runs in a separate task to handle the reading and writing, and I increased its priority slightly. With it back to zero, you still get a good transfer rate, but it's nowhere near as consistent depending on what the rest of the machine is doing. Aside from that, I successfully managed to use wget to pull all kinds of files from Aminet, which was very cool. And now that it's working in my A590, I wondered to myself, what about my Amiga 2000? So I copied the driver over and configured it and rebooted, and I got a really strange GVP error message. This message was triggered as a result of requesting the MAC address from the blue SCSI, which uses a non-standard SCSI command. So I adjusted the blue SCSI firmware to put a second copy of that command somewhere else. And the problem magically disappeared. As you can see in this video, it also reappeared when reading larger files than just a ping. So I created a second command to redirect the read command to, and the problem here disappeared as well. Clearly, the GVP card is a little bit fussy about the commands it receives and what it does with them. I guess it's no surprise, I doubt the authors were expecting anyone to do anything like this. And it was really nice to see the Infinity Music Player running too, which for some reason crashes on my other machine. I'm wondering if it's some weirdness with the standard Amiga 500 and Kickstart 3.2.
Now what really surprised me was that Wi-Fi signal manages to get outside of the Amiga 2000 case. That thing is built like a tank and solid metal everywhere. Maybe it's escaping through the tiny slither of plastic where I've mounted the blue scuzzy. The only downside to this is while it's running, the hard disk light will flash constantly. I'm sure there's probably a way to prevent this in the blue scuzzy firmware, but I haven't investigated this yet. So there you have it. That's what I was doing in the evenings and weekends for the last couple of weeks. I guess I don't need this anymore. I'm sure there's a lot more that could be done to improve this, but it works well enough for me and I think I've taken the project as far as I can. I've put everything on GitHub, links are in the video description, for anyone that's interested. If anyone out there wants to take up this project and have a laugh at a noob writing Amiga driver code, then I'd be more than happy for you to do so. And on the subject of updating and maintaining, Roadshow just got an update in the last week too. Fantastic! Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.